and transcription. Uh, this is the Flotilla Friday call for April 22nd, 2022. Um, I have to leave in, uh, at 10 to the hour. Um, so uh, I see Vincent has joined and he's already co-host. So um, uh, I wanted to make sure we talked about uh, uh, Wendy and Vincent and I and, and some other folks um, even on this call uh, have been talking with Meta Project about doing mapping for Meta Project, um, and um, I, I feel a little bit bad and and a little bit not bad. Um, <laughs> uh, Wendy and Vincent are just trying to get the thing done, <laughs> um, so I come in and it's like that's great, um, and I need you to add this overlay of the decentralization organization stuff that we need to do. <laughs> um, so. Uh, so one of the things to talk about is um, I think um, the, the way I see this wanting to work or the way, the way I think it works best to model decentralization for everybody is for there to be a sovereign that does maps and mapping and mapping standards stuff um, on, on behalf of, I guess is one way to say it, maybe um, the, the meta project. Wow, Grace. That's a great question. <laughs> I, I was trying to uh, I was trying to answer that question with David Bovel yesterday, and um, he has a whole thing about. Well, I'm not going to go into. Um, uh, I, I shouldn't. Uh, I'm, I'm not making fun of David. He actually has a pretty good point. He's like. Pete, I, I get tired of these metamost channels where it's like a channel about something and the, the idea is we're all supposed to join the channel and like, you know, oh, kumbaya and everything's wonderful. And it's like, I'm tired of that. I want people, I want peer, pe person to person connections, you know. Pete, since you asked me to be in the meta project, I, I'm interested now, you know, um, rather than kind of this blanket invitation, oh, you should join this channel and it's wonderful and kumbaya. Um, uh, Grace, the Meta Project is uh, something spearheaded by uh, Jordan Sukut. Uh, it's he's been working on it for years. Actually, um, it's finally coming to the point where he's. It feels like he's launching. Um, uh, we're launching. Um, the idea is that he wants kind of a fractal. It's almost just project management and the idea of um, of focusing on uh, humanity's highest purpose. Um, but that's, there's not much more to it than that um, in the simple case. Um, but he's basically like, okay, we need to fractally scale and grow out uh, the capability to make the world a better place, um, be pro-humanity, pro, I don't know, world maybe, rather than the way that we've got ourselves into a blind corner on. Um, it in, and in dis describing this to David yesterday, it doesn't make much sense unless you've heard and, and had some conversations with Jordan. And then it's like, oh, okay, <laughs> that does sound like a good thing to do. Let's let's uh, join this effort. Um, and and so that sounds uh, when I hear it, and, and I'm looking at Grace's. Uh, pensive face, or, or looking at David's David's uh, 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 jester face, um, it, it there's like it sounds messianistic, but it's not. I'm gonna say, um, Jordan Jordan isn't a messiah kind of person. He's actually really good, really heartful at listening and absorbing and reflecting, um, kind of the um, the energy of of the people that. Uh, that we can continue to gather into the community. Okay, you can go ahead and keep talking about this mapping. It sounds very similar to what these guys at Guyanet have started talking about this mapping thing that they're doing. And another thing, this Climate 2025 group is also trying to do mapping. Like there's a lot of these sorts of things that are going on. So uh, mapping so. is like one part of what um, the Meta Project needs to bootstrap. Um, right now, it doesn't have a good reflective way of, you know, of seeing itself, right? So there's, I don't know, there are 20 or 50 people involved and it's like, we can't see who they are. So uh, two weeks ago, we finally made a, a 
people directory, more or less. And we've got 15 entries in that right now. Um, mapping, though, is kind of like one, one activity that's key, but not the big activity of Lionsburg. The big activity is Lionsburg is, is other stuff, you know, um, regenerative ag or uh, social justice or whatever. Um, mapping happens to be one of the bootstrap ones that seems to be really important. And so uh, Jordan kind of reached out to, uh, it, it's almost overlaps actually with Flotilla. Um, Flotilla has been thinking about directories and mapping and matchmaking for you know a year and a half uh, within the network. Um, and so when Jordan wanted to say, hey, uh, we need to start doing directories and mapping. Um, that was kind of the group that he turned to, but he didn't really turn to it as a group. Um, and so, and so back to my pitch, kind of the way the way I see this is that there's a sovereign um, uh, in the OGM sense of the word that does two things. One of them is working on standards for schemas and interoperability. Um, and then actually doing mapping into databases built on those, those schemas and visualizations built on those schemas and, and the interoperability. So that sovereign could actually be Flotilla. Um, uh, we could, I think with a little bit more organization, Flotilla is not quite organized or, or structured enough to answer that, that call um, as Flotilla. But with a little bit more structure, Flotilla could answer the call and do it. Um, I, I think it would be better if we had a separate sovereign that was the mapping group um, sovereign for want of a better name and we need a better name. Um, so then the mapping group sovereign would be in charge of doing that. Flotilla for me is still kind of, I, I like that it's a little fuzzy and, um, and it's kind of still trying to define itself. Not that it ever really needs to be defined, but you know we're interested in interoperability and matchmaking and directories and um, you know group process and all that kind of stuff. So I would keep them separate. Um, so that's one of the things I wanted to talk about on today's call. Um, that also allows the mapping group to continue to accrete more people who are just interested in mapping, you know, especially for Meta Project. Um, and then Flotilla can be a little bit more flexible and doesn't have to be that group. Um, but that's kind of one person's opinion. It's, I, you know, as Flotilla, we could kind of talk through that. I like the idea that <clears throat> um, Flotilla, Flotilla does exist separately if only for the purposes of being able to invite other people into that mapping project and, and have, you know, you know, outreach and humility about not being the only people who are doing this, et cetera. So I think that's cool. Um, full disclosure, earlier this morning, I, I actually did go over the maps and mapping channel and said at channel, by the way, um, there's a mapping group that's starting to form. So, um, that could either accrue to Flotilla or it could accrue to the mapping group. I didn't make it one or the other in that channel, but um, I want to get the ball rolling. And then I, the, the reason I'm so excited or uh, the reason I'm pushing on kind of thinking through this now and making a decision now is that um, more in large uh, meta group, or sorry, meta project. Meta project uh, needs help modeling uh, formation of sovereigns and um, the request for guidance process and things like that. So this is a perfect opportunity to to just go for it. And and I think the the sooner we get this sovereign and decentralization infrastructure going, the better. Um, uh partly because that's how we're going to scale as fast as meta project needs to scale um and partly i'm i'm a little nervous that it's i i um when i go off on my decentralization architecture stuff uh it i 
I think it makes sense to people and especially importantly, it makes sense to Jordan and he's like, yeah, that's, that sounds right. Um, but if we end up starting, I, we're still in, not uh, fully formed enough that if we, if we started with some, something else, if um, the mapping group work, you know, direct was a subset of the meta project rather than a sovereign, um, it would be really easy for that to replicate rather than to do it the, the decentralized way. So I'm really anxious to get- Can you repeat started. that last part? Do you mind? Um, Cause I think which, I'm starting to get which, what you're talking about, but I'm not sure. Well, the, one of the things, I'm, when, whenever I'm talking about decentralization uh, and especially with, for the meta project, I'm doing something a little bit more assertive than I usually do. Um, I, I like to, I like to let people make good or bad decisions for themselves. Um, uh, and, <laughs> uh, and truth be told, it's because I had a past life where, um, uh, where I was some kind of nasty bastard who was uh, absolute ruler and 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 made everybody do the right thing instead of like letting people come to the decision. So, so in this life, <laughs> um, in this life, I'm pretty careful to to tell people here are your options. You decide rather than you know like here's the right way to do it. You know, I'm just going to short, short circuit 20 years of growth, uh, your personal growth. You know, it's like, okay, if you need the personal, I, in this life, it's more like, if you need the personal growth, if you need to bump through the wrong ways to do it, that's fine. I'm, I'll let you do that. I'm a little bit different with Meta Project and this decentralization because we want to go fast. Um, I, I, I'm pretty, I feel pretty sure about the intuition about the way decentralization works. I've been thinking about it for, um, uh, uh, you know, a couple of years pretty intensively in the Plex actually. Um, uh, so now back to what I said before, Wendy, um, what I do is I say, this is the way it should work instead of this is one of the ways it could work and we should talk about it. So in, even in the meta project, um, what, what I feel is that it's, it's really easy for us now for Jordan to say, there's the meta project, you know, now we're 50 people, but in a year, in, in six months, we'll be 500 people and in two years, we'll be 5,000 people, whatever. And it's really easy for people to um, holographically because we have that org chart of business imprinted in our brains and in our culture and society, and, and every, probably every, every one of us has worked within an org chart organization, we have that holographic view of, oh, cool, there's 500 people in Meta Project. It's organized like, you know, like GM um, uh, or, or IBM or whatever. There's an org chart, Jordan's at the top, you know, there's lieutenants, there's departments, you know, and even if we don't want that to happen, it's really hard to think otherwise, right? So as we, as we start talking about there should be a mapping thing, it's really easy to go, oh, cool, let's have a mapping department of the meta project. Um, and, and, the funny thing is that's not wrong for you know an organization of 500 or 1,000 or 10,000 or something like that. It starts to get really wrong when it's for an organization of 100,000 or a million. It's really, really wrong for a movement, right? Um, what we want is a movement, hashtag meta project. We don't want you know, to replicate Google um, uh, instead. So, um, so I always feel a bit subversive and, um, and for me personally, it also feels like I'm, I'm, I'm not letting people have the option of agency, even though I don't think that's quite true. I, it's, a, it's a personal thing that I have. Um, whenever I say, this is the right way to do it, the mapping project should be a sovereign. You know, it's like, Pete, come on. There's like 
30 people involved, why is the mapping project to have to be a sovereign, you know? Um, it would be really easy for the mapping project to be a sub project of the meta project. And then, and then the next people coming along would go, oh, I see how this works. There's a mapping department and I wanna be in this, you know, social dimensions department and yada, yada. It would be really easy to holographically recreate the enterprise organ organization structure. Um, I, I like every day I'm worried that I'm anxious that that's going to happen. And so I push to, to do it the other way, to do sovereigns and decentralization. And I feel guilty about it, honestly. Um, and I try not to reflect that, you know, that whatever personal thing makes me feel guilty about that into, or, into conversations. But I guess we got super, uh, super personal or whatever. Um, does, so Wendy, does that answer your question? <laughs> more than uh, TMI. Yeah. What, no, that was great. What, what that was is, great. I have thoughts, but I want to let Vincent go since he has his hand up. What's a sovereign? Um, today, is, today is anxious guilt day, <laughs> I guess. Because <laughs> as soon as, I, thanks, Jonathan, that's a great question. Um, uh, and the thing that I, I shouldn't be saying right now, and I, I have to say it because today is anxious guilt day. Uh, sovereign, I think, is the wrong word. Um, uh, <laughs> I think I'm holding myself to, well, my own, my own being an asshole standard or something. I don't know. Uh, anyway, um, sovereign, I think, is the wrong word. So if we come up with a better word, I would be so happy. Um, anyway, Jonathan, sovereign is a, is a term that came out of the, uh, actually OGM and Lionsburg. Lionsburg and Meta Project are kind of synonyms. Um, I'll let Wendy describe <laughs> <laughs> um, We have a whole nother thing where Lionsburg and Meta Project are essentially synonyms right now. And, and a few of us on this call are tearing our hair out because of that. Anyway, Lionsburg and OGM, <laughs> Linesburg is also the meta project. Linesburg and OGM were working for a long time on, on uh, uh, partnering more or less. And we were less evolved, less, I don't want to say, I don't want uh, less, uh, less knowledgeable about how decentralization works and things like that. And we were flailing around more. So um, anyway, sovereign is the idea. It's, it's uh, an individual or a group that stands alone, that's autonomous, that has um, agency. Um, so that's kind of what sovereign means in the real world. Uh, and, and in the OGM sense, it, it's literally an, organization, an individual who's a sovereign individual or an organization who's sovereign. Um, uh, so does that, did, did I cover that Jonathan for you? They're not accountable to anybody else there. Well, they're accountable to somebody else. Um, you're always accountable to somebody in society, right? Um, but you're not, um, you're not beholden to somebody else. Um, you have agency. So, so not a sovereign, um, so, so the mapping department of, of a 500 person company, um, uh, you know, the, the CEO and the board and HR hold that department's checks and um, their employment agreements and things like that. And they can terminate agreements, um, you know, unilaterally, basically. Uh, so a mapping sovereign um, has its own uh, individual agency separate from, uh, separate from the meta project. The meta project could say, well, I don't like the way you're doing it, you're fired. And the mapping project, the mapping group doesn't dissolve at that point. The, uh, the accountability and the agreement between the two is severed if, if mapping project isn't smart. Um, but the, the sovereign stands alone. Um, so there's other things like sovereigns can make different deals with different people. It doesn't have to, it's not, you know, uh, again, in an enterprise, uh, 500 person enterprise, the mapping department is never going to work for somebody cooperating with the company or somebody um, 
somebody especially competing with the company unless the CEO and, and the board likes that idea. Um, the, uh, in the decentralized model, the mapping group sovereign has the agency to decide who it, who it works with and under what terms. But yeah, you, you pretty much got it, Jonathan. Vincent? Well, I wanted to screen share and just uh, share like a reflection I've had recently. Uh, let me see. Okay. So this is the list of all the different groups that I've, that have been on my radar um, in like the game B, social impact, systems change, climate movement space. And it would be really interesting to actually, to not just do this as like a mental Passover, but to actually map these in terms of like rating the productive output of each one of these groups or communities, however that is defined, and then how they make decisions or how their governance is. From, from my kind of like basic intuition of what these groups are doing and how they operate, it seems like there's a pretty direct relationship between the ones that have made a big impact or have gotten a lot done and how simple and kind of status quo their organizational <laughs> structures are. Um, so I just wanted to bring it up that while I like really espouse the values of um, decentralized organization, um, it seems like there is a trade-off between getting things done. And, and it's not about decentralized organization. I think it's about like reinventing governance. Um, when it doesn't need to be. Um, a lot of these groups have all tried to do the same like six or seven functions and spent like a year or two trying to do it and then failed. And I'm really curious to know how um, the meta project will not just do the same thing. Um, and I feel like people, well, the other thing I see is um, people will join a group, there's a lot of excitement there's new faces, people work on something and then it kind of like falls apart and reforms somewhere else under a different name. But like the same role or the same like activities end up trying to be repeated in, in these different groups. And there's a lot of overlap in like membership across these different organizations. And um, most of them are not companies or, um, you know, some of them are nonprofits, but yeah, that's just like my, I've been a bit um, excited to actually uh, <laughs> stay with a group that's that's not going, like I think um, out of all the groups that have been in the Catalyst Alpha, more than 75% of them have like disbanded or lost energy completely in the last year, which is like a pretty high rate. So I just wanted to um, reflect on that and see what you guys thought. I'm so happy you said all of that. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I totally agree. And to me, it's like the the goal. I mean, I don't, I didn't. You were scrolling, and I didn't. There, there are some people who I'm wondering is that is that entity on the list? Is that entity on the list? And and you know, there there are. I think I've mentioned. You know, Vincent, you, you know, I think you turned me on to that video that Ollie Bream did where he said there are 433, <laughs> you know, entities um, that, that are aligned. Um, and if the magic meta project is one of those 43, you know, it's, it's hard to get traction. I mean, people are sort of bought into the ones they're bought into, if the meta project rec is recognizing, <clears throat> well, if Lionsburg <laughs> as one of the orgs on that chart, and I don't know if it's there or not, um, is recognizing the meta project as something above all of us that we don't run, you know, maybe that's that's a way to to conceptually map for um 
for cooperation and collaboration. Just a thought. <laughs> I have to go in 10 minutes. Wendy, Stacy, do you mind if I, Can or do you want to go, Wendy? Uh, I was just going to try to sum up where we're at <laughs> and go. And go I, like, I'm going to have to leave before we're we trying, go. Yeah, we're trying to get a decision, right, from your from your initial question, or at least move the, move the ball down the field a bit. Is that where you were going to go? Because that's where I was going to go. Um, I, I, I'm actually a little bit, uh, it wasn't where I was going to go. Um, uh, Vincent's, uh, Vincent's, I think, is, is a good observation. And Grace also made a, a really good suggestion in, in chat. Um, real quick, and then, <laughs> and then, I'll, um, and then I'm going to let you finish. Um, uh, so I think one of the, one of the, keys Vincent to organizational stuff uh, is uh, is one or two strong leaders um, putting a lot of energy into the project and so it's actually I'm, I'm guessing it's not so much the organizational form as the fact that there's somebody who's somebody like like me um, or somebody like Jordan or somebody maybe like kind of like Jerry um, Jerry is bimodal um, he's very good at convening and not so good at Man project managing. Um, anyway, somebody's putting a lot of energy into it, and that energy drags everybody else along. And it doesn't matter too much the the organizational form. Um, there's a lot longer conversation about that. The the organizational form, of course, does matter. Um, and and there's a lot of there is friction and overhead, um, especially to like always, you know, somebody like Pete is always catching us and going, no, we can't name it that, we have to name it this, or, you know, we have to have this relationship instead of that relationship. Um, Grace, uh, I plus one on the open source thing. And I think that actually it's, it's a good model for it. Um, in an open source project, you have a sovereign that owns, you know, the, the app or the, the, the software. And then other people, um, intersect with that, but still the, the app, the, you know, the, the project maintainers have sovereignty over the project. And I think that's a, that's a good example of not only sovereignty, but also the way that you want to, I think the mapping group wants to have open data and, you know, open standards, but they want to curate and steer, steward those the way an open source set of project maintainers does. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thanks, Wendy. Sure. Yeah, I mean, here, kind of going back to your original comments, Pete, I feel like you have, there are definitely people in the room in Meta and in Flotilla and, and OGM, other places who have expertise in a particular area. And now that we're trying to move in, in the direction of, of more action in some places, to me, it's so important to turn to the people who have those areas of expertise and say, well, what do you recommend? Like, what would be your next steps? And I think you're, um, I appreciate the humbleness of everyone who comes to the group, but in that sense, we're also holding ourselves back. If we don't ever say, well, hey, I've had 20 years experience in this area and here's what I would, you know. And, and so I'm just, to me, when you talk about it, I can tell the richness behind what you're saying in terms of your levels of expertise. I also, I have a feeling about it, but I don't have a hard opinion. So I'm waiting for someone else to say, this is the direction we're going because I'm happy to follow. And so maybe that's part of the challenge here. And I think part of the advantage of kind of doing these, these requests out to the group is who has a real sense of expertise or background or personal experience who really wants to contribute to how this is formed versus who are the people who want to receive. And there's some areas where I feel strongly and feel like I have a lot to add and other areas where I'm, I'm happy to just have someone else decide. And I think um, for me, this is one of those areas. I, I definitely, the, the, the essence of this, which for me is important, which is there's a mapping group 
and as Grace pointed out in chat, and I have experienced as well, lots of groups are trying to map. So to me, it is not just a project for Meta. It will benefit Meta. Meta may have been a catalyst to, to form this group the way I think all the groups through Meta will end up being formed. It doesn't mean that the results of that work are gonna serve only Meta, right? It'll end up serving people, bring it back. And I think that the essence of that is what needs to be in the culture and the community as well as maybe what you're referring to is written down, you know, in some ways, you know, as well, so that you're not feeling like it's a hierarchy and you're nested and, and then people start wondering, well, I, I, I did this with this group over there, but I learned something, can I apply it over here? Is that like now conflict or, you know, it's that kind of stuff we want to avoid for sure. So I was already thinking about it that way. Each thing, every group that forms is its own independent group. And then I trust you to help us <laughs> other people here to help us decide how do we frame that? Is it just a verbal thing, helping people understand that this isn't a hierarchy, you're not beholden just to meta, the work that you do there can apply to other places, or is it something that needs to be be written out a little and a little more formally. I, I'm I'm of the feeling that for me personally, the informal version, spoken version is fine, but I feel like you would have different feelings about that. And then I start to get a little lost. Personally, I just go, whatever, whatever makes sense to you, it works for me. That's kind of where There's, I'm at. Uh, formal and informal and decentralized and hierarchical are are actually separate axes. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> It's perfectly fine, I think, to have decentralized sovereigns um, with very informal agreements between each other or more formal agreements. It doesn't matter too much. Um, uh, so CSC is a decentralized sovereign, um, and, it, and it was formed out of, an, out of a, a allergic reaction I had to OGM Forum. So OGM Forum is a sub of OGM. Uh, uh, OGM belong or OGM owned OGM forum. And um, that was great uh, when, you know, we got started and it, it blew completely to pieces when it turned out that OGM didn't have enough structure to make decisions about managing OGM forum. And so like, oh my God, I, so, and so CSC was formed out of a frustration of being in a hierarchical organization as, as an infrastructure provider. Um, uh, so CSC is a sovereign that serves OGM and used to serve Kiko Lab and serves other, other unaffiliated sovereigns, individuals, and then things like Grace's Voice of, Voices of Humanity or, or, or um, uh, Lionsburg. Um, so the exactly what you're saying about maps and mapping, you know, the mapping group should be looking for other groups that's what CSC is doing and doing really well. Where OGM Forum, you know, whoever ran the discourse, it was me and Bill and, and Charles and a few other people, whoever ran OGM Forum couldn't do anything with their talent and expertise and their ability to hold space because OGM wasn't, you know, wasn't able to, to support that. And so the whole thing just blew apart. We couldn't, you know, we couldn't move. CSC is continuing to operate and work for different sovereigns. And as it turns out, for each sovereign right now, we have a pretty form informal agreement, um, not much more than a few, you know, a few lines and direct messages and email and stuff, you know, hey, is it okay if I, you know, yeah, these are kind of the ground rules, you know, don't be, don't be obnoxious. Let's, you know, let's go ahead and do it. Um, I, I think we'll end up with more formal agreements too, but the informal ones are fine. Um, Grace also said something really interesting, one or two strong leaders, that's how decentralization works. So the, the, the thing where I see de decentralization working, um, and I, I love the idea of multi-sig and uh, governance structure that is um, you know, multiple person and stuff like that. And I, I wanna see some of those, but a lot of humans, for whatever reason, work with one or two strong leaders. So the trick is, instead of having one or two strong leaders lead 100,000 people, um, you want one or two strong leaders leading a group of you know, 10, 50, 100, and working um, side by side with other sovereigns, you know, which is either led by a strong leader or, or two strong leaders or some kind of weird you know, multi-sig council or whatever. So the decentralized, the unscaling, the hierarchy um, or 
it's, I think it's okay to still have one strong leader leading a group as long as the group is small. So Pete, I know you have to, you're done, right? Yeah. And I, I know you have to leave. And I just came here wanting to comment on one thing in the, whatever you got, you know, whatever direction the mapping group takes, it was mentioned in the Mattermost, a suggestion of some data collection being done in interview style. And I just want to say that even if it's parallel, I really feel strongly there should be some human matchmaking. And I think that a lot of value can be gained out of that. And I can, you know, sell you on why another time. But I real I really feel strongly that that's an important piece that's been missing that we need. Um, I mean, if we want I don't think you need to sell it, Stacy. I think just yeah, we're all sold that can all just happen. Yeah. I've met. I've met three people in Meta now on one-on-one -on -one conversations that I hadn't talked to before and noticed that the weaving was happening. I think that's essential that that piece continue to happen for sure. I think that but it would be smart to track it and then the AI would know what types of things happen naturally that way and be able to replicate them. That would be great. Do you know do you know something that can do that though? Because <laughs> I don't. I I, I, I I'm laugh a, because I'm just I'm like, oh yes, I'm, all the dreams. Uh, my my belief is that humans are gonna be doing that for a long time. And AIs will help, but you still need a human helping matchmaking. But um, again, thanks. I think a better way to set it up in this early stage. Could be. I would like to talk more about that at another time. It's not, you know, I, the idea of it's happening, that's, I don't think that's enough. I think we really need to look at it. Uh, thanks so much, folks. Um, I'm, I, I have FOMO about the conversation to come um, and <laughs> looks like we have lots more to talk about. Cheers, talk to you later. I'm, I'm, I wouldn't head out for just anything. It's, um, it's for tw uh, Society 2045, Ken Hummer's interviewing me, so. And if I go. didn't have another call, I would be there, but I'll watch it. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks Bye. all. And uh, Vincent, I hope you've got co-hosts. I'm going to end the call. And, yes, oh, I'm did. going to leave the meeting. I'm not going to end the call. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, Ken's interview with Pete. Uh, we'll see it in the uh, comment about leadership and uh, hierarchical structures of responsibility and influence. I, I strongly favor um, evaluating people's trustworthiness to uh, represent the people they're responsible for. It's the one thing I see hugely missing in our current government structures, at least in America, <laughs> where we're just way off track on that one. Okay. Uh, okay. Hi, everybody. I don't know if you can be heard. Hey, Brad, how's it going? I hear you. Yeah, nice. I'm sorry I ended up late, but. Uh... I'll try and be here more regularly, actually. It's like a great dialogue. Um, and I came in late, so forgive any uh, redundancy or whatever. But yeah, apropos of the one or two strong leaders, that's what I think trust networks are really good at is sort of not differentiating between, you know, the Roger Ebert and the box office, right? I mean, if you, if you, if you everybody's a movie reviewer, right? Robert Roger Ebert is obviously a very successful one, and my mother is not such a good one. Um, and everybody in between, some are really great. So there's no reason why you have to choose oh one or two strong leaders like the the you know the Roger Eberts of the world or the box office, which is one person one vote. I think there's a lot of um, value in the sort of the network centrality as a proxy for. Um, authoritativeness and so you can go all the way from the most authoritative down to the least authoritative in this as a continuum and also i mean this is the basics of um of liquid democracy it's just you know mm. it um you know delegation pe the people who are there who show up and have the have the um 
you know, the confidence and the knowledge to contribute, contribute, and then the, those that are not feel like they're not well informed enough can abstain, and they get represented by the people they've delegated to. All about that. I, I, I just, I, I want to both second that and also um, add the nuance of the ability for people to say, you know, to, to have the, the control of what would be a black box in certain situations. And, and I think you're about this too, Brad, to say, you know, I really, I found this one strong leader whose taste in movies matches mine. It's not Roger Ebert, it's, you know, Joe and, and filter out the other voices and, and go with that person's recommendations or to get, you know, the largest possible field to say, I wanna, you know, I just wanna see what's popular among people, but to have that, that decision be able to be made you know, on, on, based on someone's individual levels of trust and, and, you know, reasons to, as you were saying, like say, I'm not an expert in this. I want to defer to an expert um, or not. And, and, and that control, that, that ability to filter seems really important. Yeah, I think that there's the one, one helpful, um, sort of bifurcation for me is, is separating the tallying from the expression of opinion, right? Everybody expresses an opinion to the extent they're available, knowledgeable, et cetera. And then how you tally the, the consensus or the alignment is pl a plug-in, right? You, you can say it's one person, one vote. It, it's, it's liquid democracy. It's half. It's some other tallying mechanism. So you can, you can separate them and actually learn a lot from that. I noticed that uh, Grace is trying to pull us back on track in the chat. Um, I just don't even know what the track is like, because Pete seemed to be getting it that he wanted something, but then he went away. And I don't feel like we helped him assuage his guilt, which was felt like the minimum thing we could have done for it. But I, I like, yeah, were Wendy or Tracy was like, were you also involved in this meta project thing? And was there something that we could do to help you? that he was pointing at like well yeah i'm trying to figure out what was the thing we were trying to go towards yeah i apologize i derailed that because i came in and i don't know anything about the meta project mapping project so yeah i mean i can speak to it a little bit i uh, so the the side conversation no problem brad by the way hi nice to meet you no i don't yeah. know that we've met before um no, i've heard of you yeah i've heard of you too um yeah, so there was a side conversation about how to, and, and Pete's right in that we want to take these first steps of setting up subgroups or side sovereigns or whatever we're going to end up calling them. Um, we start, start our best foot forward in terms of creating the patterns that we want to be echoed as the project grows. So that's what I hear and what he's saying is how do we want to go about setting up these different groups? And Vincent had offered um, to set some stuff up in Catalyst so we could start using Catalyst at, just to capture, not to say that Catalyst will be the place, but just because there's already need for to put things in places and to start creating some groupings. And, um, and so Vincent had thrown out, hey, let's just create these groupings. And Pete was like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> let's put a little more formal, a little formality. Let's put some thought behind this, which is fair. I'm still, I, I'll be, I'll be vulnerable here and say, I get confused when he talks about it. I, I feel like he talks a little bit in circles and I think he's going in a direction that I understand. And then he'll circle back around. And I think he's trying his best to keep all options on the table, but in doing so, at least for me, if I understand that that's what's happening, right. I end up just getting more confused and, and we're not, we didn't, we're not taking a step forward. And I feel like that happened again in, in the meeting today. So if I'm not alone, maybe, maybe we can, maybe the, the group here can help to put some framing on it in a way that makes sense. I would love to get to a point where Vincent and I could leave this conversation and feel like we know what we should be setting up and, and um, 
and not necessarily in Mattermost. We can pattern something differently in Mattermost, but at least in Catalyst, so we can start doing some work there. That would be really helpful. Thank you, Grace. Okay. So here's here's my like because I keep I keep saying I'm a Jew and like that because um and, and the reason I keep saying that I'm a Jew is because I think of Judaism as a decentralized autonomous organization. And so I always like when people are like, this is how decentralization works, I'm like, hey, we're still alive. Um, and this is how I think that this works in a relationship to your whatever you want to call it, side sovereign cells, whatever, foot forward subs. And so this is how I think it works, is that when there's a thing that should be done, let's say adding a, uh, a, a something to the map, right? There's a process by which it gets like this pull request, you could call it a pull request, that it gets approved. And you might say, okay, well, all of the subs or bros or cells or whatever, because they're kind of bros, right? They're not really subs, they're kind of bros. They're kind of siblings to one another. So all the siblings can approve a pull request. I'm gonna just call it pull request in addition to the map. And you need at least three of your siblings to approve it for it to be in there, any three of them. And every sibling needs to, in order to join to be a sibling, you need approval of whatever, right? And so that any group, and you might say a sibling needs to have five participants in it and something like that. And so that you have, you have um, some kind of uh, a network in which anybody could approve anybody. And there might be a kind of cliquishness to this, like I approve yours, you approve mine. And if that becomes a problem, maybe some of the other cells get together and say, hey, those five guys are just, you know, whatever. But that seems to me about how things happen, right? And so I'm just thinking about, you know, we like just juice, right? Like we made a country and we didn't all vote on it and there was no liquid democracy or any of that. It was just like, okay, some of us said, hey, we should go back to Zion. And most of us went like, oh, that's, yeah, good luck, man. And, uh, <laughs> but enough of us did go back and eventually enough people started, some people were like, oh, you know what? I'll buy some trees and give you some money. And some people were like, I'll go build a little farm in the desert and like, good luck. But enough of the subs or brothers or whatever bros went there and did it, that it became a something. And that's kind of true of anything like, oh, a bunch of us decided to live in Brooklyn. It's like, all right, whatever, Brooklyn, fine. That's where you want, you know, so you and those subs recognize each other and can do certain things together, but other things maybe they don't do together. So that's kind of how I would see the mapping thing is like, there's some approval mechanism for you to be a sibling. And then any X number of siblings can approve each type of activity. Some activities only need three siblings to approve. Some need a majority of siblings to approve that kind of thing. And so that's why I called it multi-sig instead of voting because I don't really like voting, you know, like voting kind of, it's kind of majority rule here. I'm just saying, well, if you got enough people who say it's cool, then it goes in because otherwise you end up with this, like, oh, we all got to go, it's voting day and oh, I got to vote again. And whereas if you have like, a, oh, well, three, bros approved it and it goes, you know, then, you know, then maybe only really super big things need to be approved. Yeah. By a majority. Yeah. And I, I guess for me, or Brad, I'm sorry, your hand. Okay. You put your hand down. Yeah. Okay. I just want, I didn't want to, I don't want to jump ahead of you. Um, I think for me, yeah. Right. I, I they were so early in the process. There are no siblings. <laughs> it's enough, you know, and, and I don't, I, I like the idea of say Jordan not having to to say yes to everything and I think there's a little bit of from 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 what I'm gathering from Pete he would like to see Jordan say yes to everything so that there's a you know so that there's an accountability to the client right now and I'm more of if we're trying to create a, a you know decent a, a DAO kind of structure, then I'm, I'm looking to get kind of Jordan out of the middle as quickly as possible, but that's me. And, you know, I, I, and none of this stuff has been talked about openly. So I'm just bringing this up kind of openly for the first time. Um, and, and it's not like I've had side conversations with Pete about this even. So to me, that's just, it's just a feeling and we're feeling our way through it. 
and this is part of the part governance, but it's part just like there are a group of people who want to work on mapping and, and can we just create a group, <laughs> start working on mapping. And I'm not, I, there's a part of me that's like, I don't really feel like I need to go through the meta project in order to do that. We can start, we can just set up a group that wants to talk about mapping and we can figure out later how it fits or doesn't fit into, into meta. That's also a thought from my perspective. Just to combine what Wendy and what Grace, what you just said, like as far as you seeing like Jordan being mo moved out a little bit, I see like at least a triangle or three siblings that could work with Jordan that together have that, you know, authority to move things. And even within that group of three, there may be others who could step in if one of the three aren't there. So it's like, circles of trust building outward, if that makes any sense. <laughs> Sorry, I had to unmute. Um, uh, can somebody give me a quick uh, high level on what the mapping project is or the meta project? Is, I'm coming to this fresh and don't, don't waste time, but um, it'd be a okay, good or is there writing? <laughs> it's a really good question. That's why we're laughing because we don't have the answer yet. That's what we're trying to figure out. So okay. my 30 second version, oh good, Vincent's gonna do something. Thank you, Vincent. <laughs> and, Vincent like, and I'm really, like when I said, take what Vincent says really seriously, it's because like, you know, Vincent has done some profound mapping and it's hard to say that there is a result to be had from it as Vincent himself said. And it's, and a lot, a number of these groups, as I pointed out, want to do mapping and directories. And I've seen quite a number of failed directories, quite a large number of failed directories. And so, yeah, I would take very seriously the idea that like we need to go beyond a mapping project or something that is just going to end up as another directory. Okay, so when we talk about mapping, we're talking about mind mapping. Um, yeah, we were, I'm sorry. Like, yeah, I'll clarify that piece of it. Um, we were talking about mapping people's projects resources as, as a starting point. So what Vincent was showing you right there was, was our, our first meeting about it was talking about how we want to structure an air, you know, an air table or a database, making an argument that air table would be a good place to start so that we'd have a lot of flexibility on, on the inputs and outputs. Um, and so that we could potentially create some good interoperability with other people who are already doing mapping projects and also have the flexibility to generate different visuals based on the data in ways that people want. So it could be a grid, it could be a spreadsheet in the end, you know, something that's that's made really pretty. And he's he has all those images there that give examples of the different things that could be generated from the same set of data. Um, and so doing that, you know, so so our, our first conversation, and there's a Kumu map. So first conversation was really about the the the, the structure of the database. And that was a good conversation. Um, in hopes that, and, and to your point, Grace, what I really like in the essence of what you're saying and, and what Vincent was pointing out is that the work is still valuable, right? It, it's If we're trying to do the work together and we're not doing it just for meta, if meta disbands, the work is still there. And so to me, it's, it's keeping that in mind of going, these good people coming together with good ideas for for the betterment of not only themselves, but for the betterment of their the, the community from which they come from potentially, and also maybe something they're looking towards helping as well, either in their community or the meadow or something else. And, and the work that gets done still has value, whether or not the project disbands or a particular role is lost or a particular person leaves the project and things like that. So that those are the things I'm trying to hold in my head um, while doing these things. and just for my own sanity, you know, why am I putting 40 hours a week into one particular thing? Because I know that it's going to serve it. I enjoy doing the work. This is work that I enjoy doing. And I'm hoping it'll serve multiple communities, not just this one. I'm listening for things that are going to serve more than one, one, uh, 
one output, if that makes sense. Um, Vincent, if I could screen yeah. share, I, 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 I can, oh, unless you want to go ahead and talk. Yeah, I just wanted to real quick while I pull these things up um, to summarize, because I know also Lucrece and some other people here didn't um, know the full context for the mapping. Um, but basically to summarize, um, we want to map people pro and projects and as well as organizations, groups and communities, um, as well as like the resources that those people and groups have been curating as well as needs, offers, opportunities, ways that people can help each other out with projects, each other's groups, or just personally. Um, with that, we kind of made the we made the proposal to use Airtable as the primary database for mapping um, because it allows for a variety of inputs, including like forms, including um, catalysts, including just bulk editing on the spreadsheet, including importing from Google Sheets, Google Calendar, CSV, JSON, XML. Um, and then also um, we have Catabot set up in the Mattermost channel so we can pull out messages. Um, I'm sure, Brad, you have some other ways of, um, I can put Twitter in here and we could probably get Twitter, you know, going into an Airtable somehow. Um, and then in terms of having um, a group of people that is stewarding that database, keeping it organized, accepting, you know, merge requests and figuring out how to dedupe things, um, making it easy for people to keep these things up to date, then that allows us to have all these different outputs. So from Airtable, we can have, this is a, you know, a, a Kumu map that is generated from Airtable. Um, these are two catalyst views of a project directory that comes from an Airtable database initially and then gets imported, um, right? Like a factor stream. So I was able to set up an automation to send new records to RSS, which could then be imported into factor. Um, the tapestry um, also can hook up directly to an Airtable. So the idea be behind the mapping is and I, I, I made this in like 10 minutes because I've done literally all of these project mappings that have went nowhere for some, for like three main reasons. Um, like I started a game B mapping, I started, and, and it was kind of just like um, the way that people are working together, the, the desire to have a brand on the map and to say, oh no, we need to like, you know, make sure we, you, like, it's really interesting. This trend that I've noticed is that they're starting like two years ago, there was this push where people would say, check out our database of the top 200 VCs. And it would be like a free database that people put together, but that would just be like a marketing funnel to like sell a product. So it seems like up until now, mapping and like curated lists have been used just to drive like advertising revenue or clicks to some other product. It's like, like people don't actually, <laughs> it's like maps don't get any attention. They're just used as a tool to like direct energy somewhere else, which is really, really interesting. But for the purpose of the meta project, I think it's like, we need maps and not just like singular maps, but we need maps that go across organizations so that we can find each other quicker and we can catalyze action and coordinate better because we keep redoing not only projects, but then within projects like initiatives, like the mapping efforts, like, like how can we map the 10 failed mapping initiatives within all these projects uh, and then see like, okay, what is the thing that failed with all 10 of these and how do we do it differently next time? That's where I think it's going. Great. Um, yeah, that's amazing. Um... Vincent, uh, on your maps, I noticed there's no cycles. Is that a is that just uh, is that just because of the way you did it, or um, everything is either in or out? But it, it doesn't seem doesn't come back around. Is that just uh, because of the, the, the is that a limitation of the system? I guess, or is it just a w the way that it got done? Oh yeah, no, it's that visualization was just showing um, the data types going in and out. Um, but yeah, in terms of like being able to keep the information up to date, that gets, that's more complicated. And that's kind of what 
you know, I think we need to have everyone at the table to talk about because the way that Catalyst will provide updated data and the way that Factor will provide it and the privacy that comes along with pulling that information is different for each source or each like partner that's like working with the data, like something like Murmurations is gonna have a much more open thing where it's like, hey, all the data is public. You can take whatever you want. Whereas something like Catalyst where people have personal information on profiles, only if it's public, then it could be merged back. If it's private, if an update has been made in Catalyst and it's private, it's not gonna get federated back to the main map unless that main map has the same privacy settings. So that's where it gets a little more complicated. And that's where we kind of need everyone who's going to be working on this to be in the same room and figuring out how that happens. Um, the simplest way to do it for in terms of like manually um, within Airtable, there's, um, let me see if I can get, find the tab. So within Airtable, we had, a, we created a little, um, like a people, um, database from our first meeting and there's a um, an extension you can use which lets people like update I'll do mine which lets people update their own record so um, I could change my location and that'll update it but it's not as simple for things where we're pulling data from APIs from multiple APIs and stuff like that Um, cool. Well, I, I just wanted to spend two seconds here showing you something. My, you know, my hammer um, for the last, uh, oh, I don't know, a year and a half has been um, around uh, graph databases. So just a little history on that. This is my day job, right? So it's uh, education, you know, uh, we, we do kind of education on demand for or by, by job role. So this is a fashion designer. These are the skills that the fashion designer has. And this is, and then we, we aggregate content and, and deliver it based on what their interests are, what their skills are, what their needed skills are, et cetera. And one thing you'll notice here is this is strictly hierarchical. They have, you have job families and jobs and job and sub jobs, right? And, but each job points to multiple skills and the skills are, uh, are not, unique to that one. So it's not a, not a strict hierarchy once you get to the skills. So you actually have to have two taxonomies. So what we've, been, what we've been doing is going to a graph database where a job is a node in a graph and a skill. So in this case, the, the blue is a job and the, the uh, skills are red. Okay, so this, these are the skills of you know, interpreter translator, but communication skills has lots of jobs that require communication skills. And uh, I found this, you know, it, it, generally these kind of graphs get really daunting, but if you kind of slice it where, to the context you're in, it, it, you can actually make sense of it. So in the white here, you could think of as a dialogue box on this thing, right? So this thing is a job. And on that dialogue box, you could, you could have things like, you know, this is not important, this is very important or, you know, uh, you know, express opinions, comment on it, whatever you can. So I'm looking at your map, Vincent, and I'm thinking uh, if you moved that into something that was nodes and edges in a graph database, and then those, those nodes, the other thing about the size of the font here, it's a little hard to tell is it's uh, network centrality, right? The communication skills is really big because it's highly used. Um, so you could, you, people could actually up and down vote the size of something really interactively. So you could say, yeah, you know, I don't think that's very important, but somebody else says, I think it is important. And enough people say it's important. It gets bigger. Right. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, I'm, i you know, it's, it's a, you know, it's a fairly new database technology, but I'm really loving it. It's really nice to the, the, the way of uh, querying it is really um uh, intuitive. So you can just say, well, I want to see the skills that are most related to this job, but two degrees away or whatever. I mean, there's lots and lots of ways of kind of intuitively querying, you know, a graph like this. Mm -hmm. So I just, you know, I used to be, I was an actual cartographer in the, at the beginning of my career. So oh, cool. mapping, like the traditional mapping is where I got started, but um, I love mapping of all kinds.
That's great. Yeah. Say, thank that. you, Brad. That was super cool to see. I, I I look at that and I'm just imagining, you know, the ability to look at the characteristics, um, whether they're the nature of. I mean, I'm thinking about it in terms of of the organizations and entities that we're like working with, wanting to collaborate with and people as well, you know, and being able to say, and I'm sure you're just about to show me this, you know, it's like there are characteristics that Gene Russell has or Doc Searles has that are have overlap or don't have overlap. And if you're if you zoom in on one of those characteristics or tags, you're going to see other people. And in the same case, I'm thinking with organizations. This organization is is laser focused on climate change, and that's the thing that they do. This one is broader in its orientation, includes climate change, but not as prominently. This one's a platform. This one's really productive. This one's in its nascent state and be able to like, you know, relate things in that way. That seems really powerful. Yeah, I probably just brought up the people thing because that's actually where I'm most using this, this graph database is, is how pe people are connected. And, um, you know, and being able to slice and dice those based on like, uh, you know, what their interests are, what they talk, what they talk about, who they're connected to. Um, yeah, a lot you can do with it. What, what subjects they can be trusted on. Right, exactly. That, when I think yeah. of those edges are essentially trust edges, or it can be interpreted as trust edges. Um, we, the, most, the, the most elaborate um, use of this up, up till now has been do, mapping Twitter people, and, and we sort of use retweeting as a proxy for respect or delegation. That, like if you retweet someone, then, then you probably respect them more than somebody you don't retweet. Um, and, uh, and that's domain specific, right? You, you, you know, you can, very, you can say, I, I really think a lot of this person's opinion in finance, but not so much in movie recommendations. <clears throat> I like to think of, um, for a moment, uh, maps when they're used by somebody on an adventure exploring unknown territories. Mm -hmm. In this case, the territory is really expertise, knowledge, and trust. And being a newbie myself, it's like, where is everybody? What's going on? And a map would help me find a place to begin my journey and then guide me somehow. Uh, I, I know that I, I'm not really a leader, so I just want to find my way and I gravitate towards tools and people who can tell me what the hell is going on here. Yeah, I'll just show you one more, one other thing on that on that note, Jonathan. This is this is just sort of my my what I call a penumbra, the people around me. You know, I, I went to LinkedIn and I, I noticed that all my LinkedIn connections come out into two buckets. One is the visual effects bucket because I spent 20 years in visual effects, and the other is the kind of social change inventing the future bucket. So I I just fo focused on the inventing the future bucket, and it's just a lot of great people, and you can just discover, you know, who's connected to who, who or who is this person that I don't even know. Um, but Andrew, Alexander, you know, thinks a lot of it or whatever, right? So yeah, I'm super interested, Jonathan, in that aspect of kind of people discovery um, and, uh, and reinforcement, you know, just, you know, reinforcing people that you think are great and uh, making them more discoverable by, discoverable by other people. And then the flip side of the coin is, I've done a lot of thinking, I've done a lot of writing. How do I make that uh, visible to the people that would be curious? You know, mm -hmm. I don't think I have the answer. I don't think anybody does, but we all have part of it. And how do you put that together in a nicely curated form? Mm -hmm. 
Well, back to your meta project. I'm, I'm, I'm actually trying to find something to gamify, and maybe this is a good gamification test. You know, like could we gamify it, this project mm -hmm. in some some way? I want to work with you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean good. gamify? Yeah, like do you think well, maybe I mean, people input the information or the way they yeah. engage with it to search it or what are you thinking? Um, well, I got I, just in listening to the conversation and I've in a lot of conversations about governance and you know, collective decision making and stuff. And there's a lot of um, there's a there's a lot of friction, I guess, in people not having the time to participate or, you know, too much politics to deal with and all that and um I, when i'm my particular interest is in gamifying some kind of complex collective decision that is just fun to do your part in making that decision you know but but and but where everybody who's participating can can do it asynchronously and actually see results um without it being a big like convening of people coming and talking, you know, I mean, not that dialogue isn't important, it is. The best example I can think of, I can share a video. Uh, in 1991, 30 plus years ago, I was in this event um, by Lauren Carpenter where we were in a theater with thousands of people and um, everybody had a paddle with a red and green retroreflective uh, sticker on, one, on one side and the other. And the screen could read all those dots, the red and green dots, and we played Pong with it, right? So everybody had, in real time is making an expression of opinion, red or green, right? And on the right side, red means up and, and green means down. On the left side, all, actually, they all mean red, uh, up or down, green or red. But one, one half of the theater is, is, is controlling the, the right Pong paddle and the the other is controlling the left and, and in, emergently everybody played a good game of Pong and it worked, right? So that's the kind of real simple, you know, uh, game I'm talking about that you could, you could, that could convince ourselves that there's a way of making complex decisions emergently. And, and mapping, I think, is actually a really good, good approach to it because it, when, when you think, does this belong in the map and how important is it in this context of the map versus that context of the map, right? That's an opinion. Everybody's got different opinions. And, and so it, I don't think it has to be an either or. It can be like all, sort of, yes, a lot of people think it should be so it's bigger or no, a lot of people don't think it should be so it's smaller. So I think that I can imagine anyway something where you could take a complex map that maybe is less complex when you kind of distill it down to the consensus around each each part of it and you can allow the map to be to vary according to the needs when you're looking at it so you know it, it isn't it isn't just a decision this is important this isn't important it's one person's in in on looking i mean there can be a default state of the map of course that you know can have um attributes that that are explained to the viewer but their actions on it and saying, okay, I, I just want to look at the stuff that relates to climate change here might make something get suddenly really small and something else get really big. There we go. That's to your point. I think looking through the lens of responsibility, uh, each, let's say there are 12 responsibilities, which is ridiculously small number. And somebody, a person from a responsibility, curates the material and makes that available, that curation available to everybody who has who shares that responsibility. That that's a way to efficiently digest a huge amount of input into something that people have time to consume. Because that's the bottleneck, right? Communication is hard in all kinds of ways, but especially, you know, I don't have time to read the fucking manual, right? 
So, uh, you know, what is it, TLDR? Too long, didn't read. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I mean about abstaining. You know, everybody doesn't have time to participate at their full capacity all the time. But if enough people do and they represent the others by default, then you can get to, you can get to consensus pretty quickly and efficiently. Right. I love the idea of consensus replacing voting and conventional decision making because it, it's instantaneous it, and it's live. Yeah, I think we need a better generic term for voting, you know, as an expression of opinion, because if you're if you're expressing your opinion, you're voting. Right. In some form, in some form, you're it's the, it's equivalent. Um, but voting kind of has this loaded uh, meaning to it. The same with decision. So is, is it a decision or is it an inquiry? Is it a question? Is it a poll? Is it a quiz? Right. I mean, I've been using <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've been using inquiry as the as my kind of collective noun. Yeah, I, my brother came up with the idea that uh, you could find a few people who are really good at articulating and have people say, I like the way that guy articulated it, I'm, but I'm against it. <laughs> and that, that, that allows um, for something that's similar to what we do now for voting, which I think is just too damn hard for most people because it's written in legalese. Right. But I, I like my brother's proposal because, you know, it makes the whole thing efficient and eliminates the idea of flame wars in an opinion gathering mechanism. Because, you know, you can get pretty darn bogged down in opinions. <laughs> yep. Uh, I'm going to have to run, but um, I'm glad to be here. It's, uh, I'll try and show up regularly. Thanks, Brad. Yeah, yeah and, uh, Brad, I'm curious before you run, do you think um, do you think there would be a a way or a good reason to instead of starting our mapping in a relational database in Airtable, doing it specifically in a in a graph database? Is there a reason why? it would be better to start there. Obviously, you can convert a relational database to a graph database. If you have connections, then you could. Um, but I, I'm just curious if there's yeah, your way more I mean, experience I, with graph databases. Is it better to start there for some reason? I think graphs and graph databases are good for if, you know, where you have multiple entity types and there's, there's not a um, not a real obvious way to do joins or like without the example I showed you where I had a job mapping to skills, right? We can mm -hmm. deal with that in regular databases. In fact, that's what we do. But when you start adding in users that have these jobs and are good at this skill and not good at that skill, uh, it becomes much more tractable in uh, in graph databases. Um, it would, uh, Vincent, actually, uh, Pete has been recommending that you and I talk, and I've been meaning to. I've just been so busy. But let's let's find some time to talk. I'd love to talk more about it, or maybe we can talk about it on next Friday or whatever, but um, the uh, if you want to send me an example of like a couple of tables that you have and we could, that I could give you some feedback on how that um, how that might map into into a graph database. But um, I'm, I'm sold. I mean, I've, you know, I've been using MongoDB for 15 years or 12 years or something and, and I love it, but you know, uh, OrangoDB is the one we use, and it's great. It's multimodal. It has NoSQL for just tables of documents and things like that, but it also has real efficient um, ways of doing nodes and edges and, and querying those. So, um, yeah, I, I, actually, I do think, honestly, that mapping, let's say, the regeneration space is a graph. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. there's no, you know, not doing it as a graph is, you know, you can do it without it, but I think it's much more natural to do it, um, you know, where everything everything is kind of intuitive. I, I found the, the query language is very intuitive once you get once you get used to it. Yeah. All right. I'm, I'm okay. Thanks, yeah, guys. Love, See love you next time. Guys. We'll talk to you soon. Talk soon. Bye.
I'm going to have to hop off as well. Yeah. When do you too? Hi, everyone. Yep. Before you leave, Michael, <laughs> or anybody in New York, yeah. I want to firm up the date for the first two weeks in May to get together. Oh, I'm sorry, we're recording. <laughs> Just <laughs> yeah, I can stop the recording. Hold on. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>